Hola, soy Sergio Bruguera y tú estás escuchando Functional Tennis Podcast. Welcome to episode 66 of the Functional Tennis Podcast. I'm your host, Fabio Molle. Today, I speak to our first ever Grand Slam singles champ on the Functional Tennis Podcast, former world number three and winner of the French Open in 1993 and 1994, Sergi Bouguera. Sergi was the original Spanish king of clay, bringing home the French Open title after a 20-year gap of no Spanish winners, and he spearheaded a generation of great Spanish clay quarters. We talk about winning and losing slams, not playing slams, pressure, Davis Cup, Rafa and more. Get your cup of coffee or tea ready. But before we get chatting to Sergi, a shout out to our podcast sponsor Slinger, who signed a distribution deal with Dunlop, which will make the Slinger bag available in Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, Portugal, Netherlands and Spain, as well as countries it currently is available in. And if you haven't seen or heard about the Functional Tennis Pointer, aka the wooden spoon that helps many areas of your game, and you want to know more about it, check it out at our site, functionaltennis.com. And we have a 10% discount that is valid during the French Open. Just use the code French Open at checkout. That's French Open. And if you have any questions about it all, just send me a message. Okay, let's get chatting. Hi, Sergi. Welcome to the Functional Tennis Podcast. Hello, how are you? Very good, thanks. Uh, tell me, are you still watching the tennis world, watching tennis, keeping up to date with what's happening? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm keep watching uh, the tennis because, you know, I'm still a uh, Davis Cup time from Spain and uh, also I'm um, working with uh, Joe Songa. Are you working with Joe Songa? Okay, very good. Yeah, last, last, last year and this year, but this year is injured all the year, so, so he's not going to be able to play. It's it's challenging. And tell me, what did you think of Rome? Good tournament? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, for the only surprise maybe was uh, Rafa losing to, to Diego Suazman, but also it's true that uh, his first time, you know, he's seven, seven months without competing and Rafa is the, the player that he needs to be competing and, uh, and, and it's difficult also the conditions, no public, no competing, no, and, and all, all this a lot of surprises uh, because it's uh, completely a completely new story. Do you think, Sergi, that the top players miss the big crowds a lot? Yes, yes. I think, well, not, not all the top players, everybody, but probably especially the top players because uh, top players normally um, uh, handle the pressure uh, much better there with, uh, with everything and with, with the crowd, with the public, with... Uh, all the medias over there, you know, you, you, you can feel more the pressure and they can handle much better. And playing without the crowd, I mean, it's, uh, it's very difficult because it, is, it feels like uh, a practice, no? And then all the other players, I think they can play much better with uh, without, the, without the crowd than the, than the top players. Their competitive advantage they lose. Yeah, a little bit like this. Yeah, I mean, it's better for the lower players because they play a little bit more calm and they can play like... It was like a, a practice almost. Yeah, no, I agree. That's what it, that's what it feels like. At least Rome had a few more people in, and I know Roland Garros will have some crowds as well. And tell me, do you think Rafa is going to be the man for the title in Roland Garros? For me, always that uh, French Open is uh, on. No matter how Rafa arrives, he's always the the man to beat because uh, he's always the best player in history over there. It's, I said it's uh, it's uh, it's best surface the, the the conditions the the distance of course. Uh, he, everybody has the pressure you know, at the end to beat him because he already beat him twelve times he won. So Rafa went once arrived there also best of five sets on clay. So tough to beat Rafa with it. Tell me, this is a question I was going to ask you later on the conversation, but I'll ask it now. How would a peak you done against a peak Rafa? Would you have rated your chances? You in your peak form, v Rafa in his peak form? No, beat Rafa in the peak form in French Open, for me, I think nobody's capable to do it. Because, I mean, Rafa won 12 times, but that's, we are agreed that 100%... Uh, um, all these 12 times, and maybe he was, I don't know, in his peak form or his best moment, what, uh, four or five times? All the all the other seven, for example. 
he was uh, playing well and, and very good, but he, he was not at his best. Do you feel you would have had any chance if you had played Rafa in your peak? I think, I think you know, uh, always uh, when I was playing uh, uh, and, uh, at my time, I, I felt, you know, that I was playing my best tennis. I was on my uh, nobody can beat me, you know. I, I, I felt you can lose, but you know my feeling is that uh, I'm gonna win, and may, uh, maybe Rafa is the greatest of all time. But for sure, I will find uh, uh, to win one time uh, or two times the French Open. Also, also at my, uh, at my time, the conditions was the ball was lighter, was faster. Now it's very heavy, and now it's more even more important, you know, the the power or the the, the physical condition. You know, my time. The, was was uh, much faster the court and, and, and a little bit uh, not easy but uh, not not as difficult to win a point like like today. When you were winning Roland Garros, the, the court was a lot quicker. I didn't know that. Yeah, especially especially the balls, the balls. Now the balls uh, since uh, I don't know, I don't know, ten ten years something. The, the balls are so big. That's why it disappeared. You know, you know, like the. Self from volleys, volleys with this ball also is difficult because always you have to impact on the ball and and it's not it's not easy. It disappears, you know, this kind of play self from volley, chip and charge, because the ball is very heavy, difficult to advance, and uh, and these players of touch, it disappears also, you know. And now it's, it's, it's only or you are very strong and you can hit very hard or 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 uh, or or no chance. Well, yeah, I. I completely didn't I always thought the courts got faster rather than slower which is strange I knew Wimbledon slowed down and I thought the French had s- Wimbledon is, is, is ridiculous the difference now and before the difference is, 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 is that, that is the, the biggest difference ever you know now no, no, nobody does set from volley and you can see you know exchanges of balls like uh, I don't know 20 very uh, I mean this is uh, I think never happened in the history of Wimbledon that you can pass the uh, Ten balls over the net. Yeah, you didn't play Wimbledon too many times. Was there? What was the particular reason for that? The thing is, uh, at my time, uh, it's like I said, practically unplayable when you were playing on grass. I mean, uh, you, uh, me, I was playing. I was playing second volley, first and second serve. You know. Also, I have to choose. You know, it was uh, was for me very, very, very difficult to to play over there because you cannot play two shots from baseline. And then I was uh, choosing, you know, to take a little bit break after the all the all the season until there. And then was the time that I was uh, having, you know, a little bit break. And then I concentrate on the second uh, second part of the clay court season. That because at my time was was not not too many clay court se- clay court tournaments. And then. Uh, I have to profit uh, as much as possible the clay court tournaments. Then I was playing Stad, Stuttgart, and Kitzbühel, and this kind of tournaments. And that, that makes sense. And was it the same with the Aussie Open, where you, you didn't play that often? What was the reason? Was it similar reasons? Also, for me, at that time, it was uh, like very important for me to play the, uh, to, uh, to practice the preseason. To make you know a big base for the next year. Sometimes I was finishing, you know, the masters. I was finishing very late, and then uh, I want to have like more time for uh, for prepare the season. And uh, maybe you know I was used to do like this, and it was not like like uh, now that it's not 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 considerable that you can miss one Grand Slam, you know. And then maybe you know after playing now, I, I will do it different. I will play every single year over there because I mean I was playing okay on 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 on, on high course. So I, I I will make a difference. But at that time it seems for me that you know make the preseason and to arrive uh, for the French Open as 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 best possible for me was 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 very important that and that's what I was doing this. And tell me I read were you 18 the first time you actually played on a hard court? You'd never touched a hard court before that? Yes. I mean in, in my time uh, never, never, never play one one single tournament on on, on hardcore in my life. My was uh, first time I play was uh, in um, in the U.S. Open uh, when I was 18, and I play against uh, Lake Shaira, and then I was this was my first tournament ever. Wow. Was practicing but sometimes, but uh, but never play one tournament. And then at the end of the year, I play in in indoor, and this was my first time. Even I practiced. On indoor because I never been in one indoor court that, that, that 
that it was carpet. So, so this was, was even even tougher because I mean I never in my life make one single practice on on indoor court, hard court, uh, indoor also. But you actually won a carpet title, didn't you, in Milan? Yeah, no, no. Then afterwards, I I, I play I play very well in in, in in indoor carpets. I have so many. You know, I never won a tournament. I played two finals in Milan, and I play like two semifinals in uh, in um, in Bercy, which 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 Master Mil also was a uh, in Essen. That was Master Mil and Stuttgart uh, indoor also that master, master like Master Mil. So I I did a, a lot of uh, results. I played semifinals in uh, in the Master. Uh, which was like ice also because we played in Hanover for the time that it was making the course for, you know, for Becker Sampras was so fast. And uh, so I succeeded to, to have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, results in, in big tournaments. It's good. It was really good. And just cutting back a little bit, as a junior or as a young teenager, was it always your dream to, I'm going to win the French Open? Yes, yes. For me... The most important thing for me, my, my focus of life was to win French Open uh, one day. You know, was uh, was my dream, my goal, and uh, that's what I was hitting every single ball that I was practicing to to one day achieve to win the French Open. And was there one day where you just felt I am ready to win the French Open, or just did it just happen in '93? I think I was preparing 91. 91 is playing very good. Also, I make a very good click of season and I arrive in very, very good shape. Uh, but I get injured in second round. I was winning 6-1, 5-1 to uh, Camporese that he was 20 the world and I was playing uh, unbelievable and I had a very good uh, also draw to arrive. And um, I think 91, I was also ready for, to, to win. I thought that that was my year. Then I arrived in 93 and then uh, and then I won. But 91, I, I, I felt that, you know, I was... I was ready to do something big, you know, maybe not winning, but uh, I think I was capable to do it. Yeah, you had the confidence there. And you were the first sp- Spanish man in 20 years to win at Roland Garros. So you're probably, you're the original Spanish clay court king, are you? Yes, it's like the, like the, the new generation, because, uh, you know, it was uh, the last time somebody won uh, in, in the French some 20 years ago. I, I, I never saw it, you know. I was one year old, so ne- 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 never, never saw it. Uh, somebody win the Rangaros, and maybe a lot of people neither, because um, also was not like a popular uh, like like today. Not the TVs that was before, and um, maybe you no, know, no, not everybody has TV, so no, no, not too many people saw it. They, even, even, even uh, to twenty years before. It's, I, I did see it. I remember. I remember. And I was actually a, a fan of yours. I used to have one of your rd 7s at one stage and uh, it was crazy. And I remember the Yonix poster, but I remember like even you know, the other Spanish guys, even Bersa Tegui, I remember that final. And I used to like, you sort of like all the tennis players back when you were a kid. And which final for you did you prefer against Jim or against Bersa Tegui? Well, of course, against uh, Jim. First of all, was I think the first the first final had everything, you know, that 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 you want to be in the final. I mean, like a very epic match, long match that you're coming from behind and then being the final win. You play against the number one in the world. You play in the last two times champion that was uh, like unbeatable. I never beat him, and uh, and then you play your best match and then and then and then you win. And, uh, so all, also plus is the the first one, you know. And with the Sategi, uh, also I was uh, the favorite. I had the pressure of the, the also uh, the favorite, and also that you were playing against te- teammates, you know, against the Spanish players, which is uh, at a lot of pressure. And he was playing well, so uh, it was more difficult match. And maybe you can tell us. We saw the U.S. Open, the challenges team had, and Zverev had to actually win it. They were struggling with nerves. What's it like? The difference of coming in against Jim you're not the favorite and then all of a sudden you're the favorite the next year. What sort of pressure does it just make it so much harder? Well, no, the, the second year with Jim, you know, I, I, I arrived also like very confident in, in the match. Once we started, you know, I felt, you know, I was, that time I was a little bit over him because I win in, in four sets, but I thought I should win in three because I think he escaped with some medical shots in the third set. But um, I felt that I was I was better than him. And, uh, and, uh, and also it's true that the first, matches when you have to defend then was very difficult once you are awarded in semifinals 
then you you are just focused to win your matches, not if you have to defend the the, the, the winner because you already like kind of uh, defend you already on semis, you know. Okay, yeah, no, that that makes sense. And then when you went back for a third year, you were probably hoping three in a row would have been unbelievable. And you had a tough match against Chang. The beginning of the year, I broke my knee uh, playing in Stuttgart. And then I was like a uh, few months off. And then I started to play in uh, in Monte Carlo, my, my first tournament uh, of the year. And then, you know, still was my leg was like much more thinner than the other one. Then I get a little bit injured. I play qualifying, I get them injured. And then uh, I didn't play for two weeks more. And then I play Rome and then I play okay. And then uh, I arrived to the third one like, Physically, conditions very, very low, you know, and then um, Chang, I think he played very good match. But if I was, you know, like regular, I think I, I would never lose to him on, on play, you know. Do you still keep in contact with him, with Chang or those guys? Well, no, no, not in contact. But when, when I, I see him around the tournament, because, you know, he's, he's also helping Shikori or... Or, or, or playing some senior tours or whatever. Uh, or I play one time with him in uh, in, in in the legends uh, in in French. So when once we see that and then we talk, we have fun, we have uh, you know some chat. But but once you are there, you see him not not in touch like like telephone or something. Okay, like that. interesting. And then a, a few years later, you played Gustavo Curtin in the final. Had you gone into that match as favorite also? Well, that that, that was. Difficult match also because um, you know um, 96 also I broke my uh, ankle and then uh, I was uh, struggling all through the year and then uh, 97 was uh, still uh, you know not a good year for me but you know uh, and then I had to play better and better and better but I was not playing you know my my, my best tennis and then uh, I, in fact I arrived I think I arrived to the final losing every time the first set you know I was winning more because of the you know strategy physical condition that not my tennis was. Uh, overpowering the other ones and then finally uh, I met uh, Querten which nobody knew I never played him I don't know how to play uh, and then I you know I think I played very defensive of, of the match you know I was trying that he get nervous that he missed a lot and, and then he went for the match and he played unbelievable he was fearless I think it's amazing the amount of players the generations you played I was just going through you played Sampras Agassi Courier Federer Ivanisevic Becker Quirton Edberg Hewitt Rafter Chang and I'm sure there's a lot more yeah. missing out there so you played such a wide variety of players you're only short of playing Murray Rafa I don't know Borg and Djokovic I think you've played everybody who for you was the toughest opponent when you played Federer he wasn't at his prime and different things but for you who was the toughest opponent to go out there and play for me for me my, my toughest opponent was Muster Muster Thomas Muster was uh, was more difficult day because he was playing kind of kind of like me from Bayesian but that he was physically better condition and especially also he was lefty that he, he was I was struggling with uh, with, with they tactically also the, the, how well we're playing and then uh, and then I was losing so many times with him and he just yeah he gave you nightmare so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he was he, he beat me many many times I beat him also but I, I think my my record he was 12 and 3 or something like this your dad was your coach throughout your whole career yeah okay nice and you were probably one of the first father son coach relationships Yes, yes, this is, this is, but, but this is, is difficult. I mean, for me, it was very good because my father also before, I mean, he was his job and then before he was already unbelievable coach and he had succeeded with uh, so many players with Fernando Luna, Jordi Arrese, John Aguilera. I mean, he, and he built a lot of players that, uh, uh, they, they become good players, tennis players. And then, and then I start to work with him. So, I mean, he knows what he was doing and he was, you know, one of the best coaches I ever, ever see. So uh, that that is advantage because sometimes father and coach, uh, the father is father and then become coach, but he was not coaching before. <laughs> it's because he's his son. So, and then, uh, and then also the, the, the relation is very di- different and, 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 and it's difficult. I mean, it's not, it's not something I recommend. Even, even for me, it was very good. And how do you deal with? I don't. You work, you may work with some juniors now, where you're the coach or some of your staff are the coach, and the parents want to get involved, but it's not healthy. How do you deal with that? No, because when I work with uh, some juniors or when I work with players, he has to be father and I'm the coach. If he, 
uh, has confidence on me, it's perfect. If no, then, then take another one or, or do it by himself. You know, I don't want to deal and to argue with. Uh, also, normally the fathers, they have no idea about tennis, you know, and about the, the, the concept of the sports. So, so he has to leave it on my hands or if not, then on another hands or, or he or he has to do it. But uh, in my case, you know, I'm doing it and I'm doing it and, 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 and that's it. So you set the parameters out at the start and you say, look, I'm the professional here. I know what I'm doing. Let me do it and don't get involved. Exactly, exactly. You'll be a father and uh, be involved like a father, you know, but not like questioning or the, or, or, or the tactics or the, or the techniques or the practices or why is this, why that, you know, I mean, or you have confidence or you don't. And then uh, and, and then that's it. And one you, it's going good, perfectly. once you lose it and then we finish, but... But for the moment when we work, I work, and you are the father. I mean, that's it. Yes, no, I agree. I know it, it causes a lot of controversy with tennis players, families and coaches. Yeah. Let's quickly move on to just a couple of questions on Rafa. Do you remember the first time you saw Rafa play or practice? No, my first time I think I played, I saw Rafa was uh, was when he won the French Open, you know. No, 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 sorry. I, I, I saw it before when I... One time he was playing go to to Hewitt in in, in Australia. I think he was seven six and sixty three, and then I was shocked. I, I was in, in pre, impressive what uh, what I saw. Did you think from the early days he was going to do what he did now? No, no, but it's not no 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 nobody. And and who said that he thought he was going to do this? He's lying because I mean, even now I cannot believe he's true what he's what what, what he achieves, and so so it's. it's it's impossible that somebody see this coming. Uh, it's amazing. I was only somebody had sent me a video yesterday of Rafa. I think it was is it the Valencia match, the Davis Cup match against against Germany. Ferrer was playing, yeah. and the, I'm not sure if you've seen the video where Rafa is just so pumped. The crowds go mad. And just that intensity that he had on the side of the court was amazing. Like, he, you just can't buy that. Yeah, I don't know. But this, 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 uh, the, the, the impressive is that he can do this so many times. But everything, every time is like this. So the, 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 the continuation also that at, at this level is impressive. Yeah, no, it, it definitely is. And tell me, is there any upcoming Spanish juniors we should be looking out for? Oh, there's a, I mean, there's one guy that uh, I like. This is Davidovich. That well, he plays good, but he has still settled down mentally and is, but he has you know very good tennis. And um, and there's a few, there's a few Carlos Alcaraz that is also uh, like very good player. And and, uh, and then some he, he's coming. Of course, he's not me, level forget the level of Rafa. Then nobody's gonna take this level, but like he can be <laughs> can a good player. Yeah, who knows though? As you said, you didn't know Rafa was going to do that at the start, so you don't really know, do we? Yes, but 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 anyway, it's not for me. It's not possible to repeat this, but uh, you know. Great, and just quickly on to just onto the Davis Cup. You had the luxury, or sorry, you had the Davis Cup in 2018 and 19. So you played. You were part of both formats. What did you think of the new format, Davis Cup? Well, I, I like it because I like it because I, I think the most important thing is to make one format that the the, the best players they can play, and this is the the, the only format that the, you, you you can allow to have these chances. You know that the best players can play. Also, is like all the rest of the World Cups that they play in all the sports that everybody is in the same place and everybody is the same conditions, everybody is in the same opportunities. Because sometimes, you know, Davis Cup depends you play at home or you play outside. It's, it's, it's completely another story. And also with the calendar, was sometimes was not possible that, you know, the top players can play because it meant you were playing in Australia and then next week you have to compete in Monte Carlo. And also you, you were playing the week before in Miami. So it's, it's, there's, there is no chance that uh, that the top players or the best players can play and, and also in the best conditions. And, and I think this format it allows to the, 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 all, all the players to play and they have the best conditions everybody. And also it's very intense. Yeah, and you did quite well. Yes, last we did well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was it like, that moment that was all over the news where Batista Good came back after his father unfortunately passed away and won a great match against Canada? I can't remember who he played now, but what was the atmosphere and the changing room? Well, like? I mean, this was, was like, 
I one of the I mean impressive things I ever see on the sport, you know, because yeah. on Wednesday uh, then he went to disconnect the father because they have to disconnect it. He doesn't pass away yet. He, he they, they call him that they have to go there because they have to disconnect the father because he's suffering because he was with a with a machine. And then he went there, he disconnect, and then he starts to one day there everywhere. And then he made the funeral Saturday, and then Saturday afternoon after the funeral he he was uh, on the car going to Madrid. And then I, I make it a, a court, he can practice, or like this, uh, maybe just we have to talk, or to, let's see if he's, well, he was uh, prepared to play the next day. But then uh, he was, he's, he's, after all this, then he's playing the final of Davis Cup, and then playing the match he played and winning, and then uh, it was capital that, that, that we need to win 2-0. And then uh, for me, it's one of the most impressive things I ever see on a sport. That is absolutely amazing. Like it takes so much heart yeah. to do that. D- did I hear you say that Nadal wouldn't go to sleep until three a.m. every night? Yes, uh, uh, but not only Rafa. I mean, uh, all the players. But it's true. Rafa was playing also singles and doubles, which is uh, making worse. But uh, there's, there, was, there was one day that we finished very late, and then uh, and then because after after the match, maybe okay, you finish uh, like at at, at one thirty or something, but it's not one thirty. You have to leave. You have to do the press. We have to dinner. We have to come back to the hotel. We have to make the the the, the, the treatment, massages, blah, blah blah. And then he was uh, like putting his cart on the room at five in the morning, and then had to play the next day. And they're up early the next day, and you don't hear those stories enough that what they have to go through to be ready for the next day. And obviously, in your thirties, it's a lot harder than in your twenties. I mean. The, the, the conditions and the whole, everything that happened there was, uh, was 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 a nightmare. So we have to deal with so many things, you know. Uh, and then uh, that's why also, you know, I didn't put uh, at one one the first day I put Rafa on the on the doubles because he was, you know, like uh, playing uh, masters, go, arrived so tired, coming with an injury. And then I want, you know, to take the risk that uh, Rafa, Rafa get injured or, 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 or you know, put it in the position that he's going to finish at two in the morning and then let's go to uh, the first day and then uh, still all the week to go, you know. It was a very tough decision also have to make better. Good decision, coach, captain. Uh, and you also talked a bit about from tennis you got to, you, you love the adrenaline, the intensity. And as Davis Cup captain, do you get the same adrenaline intensity being on the side of the court? Yes, well, I try to focus because when I'm playing, as a, well, no, when I was playing, it's, you get tired, but uh, the, the the intensity, uh, the emotion, yeah, for me is the same outside because you know I try to play the the match as concentrate uh, like if if I was playing, you know, and then I feel the victory like I won, you know, I uh, now I live the victories, uh, the matches uh, through my playing. So, but uh, I'm I'm very focused and, and the adrenaline is going on also there. So you, so what I'm saying is you really enjoy it. Yeah, I enjoy it. Yeah, I like it. I like it very much. I like to teach I, and I like to coach. I I, I, I like this this, this part. And, and and getting on to coaching, obviously you worked with Gasquet for a few years. How was that experience? Ah, it was very good, very good experience because with Richard also we have an unbelievable connection also personally, and then uh, and then uh, he improved a lot, and then he 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 played very well. Was uh, unlucky with the he he has to deal with so many injuries, but uh, but uh, we we still having a lot of. Friendship, we still have a lot of in touch, and then uh, and uh, it was very good experience for me and for him, I think. And now you're working away with with Songa. How is Songa's rehabilitation going? Yeah, also very good, very good. We had very good uh, this year because also it was difficult for him because he was to come back. He started the year like 400. He has to deal with different things, uh, and uh, also it was like one year off. It's difficult to get used to to the rhythm of the. Of the of the season and and then he, he gets a little bit up and down. Also, he was injured like two times in the he, he, through the year it was difficult. But at the end, uh, you know, he finished playing, managed to win so many tournaments and then playing so well. And then uh, finished twenty. And then it's a pity because he was already you know we're gonna we're going to start the, the season you know from twenty you know for four hundred which is very difficult and also all the year playing and also we know each other very well. They were very happy. And then uh, it will be a lot of difference, you know. So, and then it's very, very sad that, that he gets injured through all the years. And when will we see him back? Next year. Next year, okay. So recovery all all the all the year, which is so. Are are you doing much work with him right now at all? 
No, no, now he's injured, he cannot play, and uh, and now for the moment I'm uh, not, 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 not doing anything. Okay, and maybe now we're going to just touch on a bit of your experience, how you can help. A lot of our listeners are tennis parents and tennis players and younger players, but let's just talk about your academy in Hong Kong. Yes. What's it like having a business really on, I wouldn't say the other side of the world, but a fair distance away? Do you be over there much? Well, uh, the, the the academy now uh, is more like uh, I'm, I'm I'm helping. It's more like uh, my father and and, and Bastian is, is is running the academy, and uh, I've been uh, you know on and off, and uh, he, but he's 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 working very good. You know, the Bastian, my father, doing an unbelievable good job. I think um, I hope in, in in a few years because it's difficult to develop. You know. A good players, but someday will be uh, one uh, top hundred player from over there. Yeah, no, Bastian does send me videos the odd time, and I see some of the work. I think you do some good work over there, and I really like it. So that's you, you and your dad have done a good job over there. But looking at, imagine you as a twelve-year-old and a twelve-year-old now. How much harder is it? Do you think it's harder now for a twelve-year-old? No. I think it's it's easier because now the, that we have like you know like academies like like uh, you have in Hong Kong or you have it here. I think there's there's so many offers that uh, that you can you can um, arrive and also a lot of you know very prepared coaches or physical conditions, nutritionists, uh, physical trainers. I think there's so so much more like professionals around the world and everybody who knows more and uh, and then now, now you have more options and it's much easier for you know for for young people though and they have more 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 facilities and and pe- people that that they know what what they what they're doing you know before it was much more difficult maybe it was like one or two good good players or good or good coaches or it was much, much much difficult to find you know people that that, that can develop your, your your tennis and to become uh, you know a good player so Kids and parents stop making excuses. No, shouldn't make excuses. You know, have uh, so many things, so many uh, opportunities. So I think with more uh, the, the part of the the kids to 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 succeed than not the the, the um, that they have not the, the the chances. You know, now you have everybody has the chances or almost. Right, because also it's true that you know it's expensive one academy, blah blah, and then and then also uh, you have to have the uh, the money to 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 do it, obviously. And what's important for a twelve, thirteen year old today who wants the dreams of being a professional player? What should they be working on? <laughs> with, with the world you you, you said, uh, is 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 more than enough work. That 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 the thing that the that, 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 that the main thing they they do work and then you know put in the hands of a good professional and work and that that the most important thing work in with 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 humidity with passion but work is the is the is the main the main work. But would you agree they have to work in the right environment? Let's take I'm in Ireland here. Eighty percent of the courts are artificial grass. And in Spain, it's like eighty percent are clay courts. So the the twelve year old in twelve year olds in Spain are learning how to not miss. They're learning how to hit different spins, different slices. Here, you're playing three shot tennis. So there's a bit of intelligence behind the hard work. Would you agree with that? Yes, but now uh, even even if we here you can work uh, or, or um, the clay, but here now in Spain for professional now it's almost every. A single place that, that 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 with the academies they have hard courts and then they 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 practice uh, hard court when they have to play hard court and then they practice clay court when they have to when they become the the clay court season now now we have the chances to play everywhere but that's why you know what there's there's, there's uh, players like Carreño that uh, he make more 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 results in hard court than than clay court. Um, Bautista the same more in hard court or indoor or grass than than clay court. So now I think uh, also it's not an, an excuse for nobody in over the world because you are be, are be able to play and to practice everywhere and to prepare yourself for 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 all the surfaces. Plus, all the surfaces are about the same almost. Well, except artificial grass. 
Ah, artificial, but, but artificial grass, there is no, not any, any tournament on artificial grass. Well, that, well, that's what I mean. Let's say in, I'm just giving my country in Ireland for an example, 80% ah. of the courts are artificial grass. So if you're a kid playing five hours a day on artificial grass, you're not really helping yourself in the long term. No, no, then, then, then it's another story. I didn't understand that. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, if you are practicing in, in one court, that, 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 that you're never going to find it in one tournament. I mean, it's obvious that, 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 that is, you know, I mean, for me, it's not a, a good, good place to, to, to practice, you know. You have to practice where the, the, you, uh, things that were you're going to find when, when you became professional. But if you practice for some place that uh, is completely another, another story, another bound, another rebound, another speed, and then it's like you play with uh, balls that doesn't exist, never uh, that uh, uh, completely different that you're going to find in the tournament, you know. Yeah, no, look, I completely agree with you. We're going to end this, Sergi, with just a few questions, some from our listeners, so, some which I've asked already. But uh, number one is, what are you doing today to stay fit and intense when you're not on the tennis, when you're not the captain of the Spanish Davis Cup team? Me, I, I normally do, uh, uh, I practice uh, uh, myself when I'm, when I'm in, in the academy and then, uh, and, then uh, and then I play with players, you know, and then and I help them and also I, I keep it for myself. And then also I like to play paddle, you know, I, I, I play, I play a paddle and then, uh, and then also I, I like bike with my friends and then, uh, do some gym like to, to be healthy also like abdominals and, um, uh, something for the legs, you know, I do things for, for, for myself that just, just to be in shape also. So you, you're keeping busy and you like the paddle. I like the paddle. I like very much the paddle. I, I love it. It's very, very fun, fun game. Yeah. Fun game for friends and families. A couple of tennis players seem to like, seem to like the paddle and it's getting big in Ireland as well here, but I know Spain has won the homes of paddle. We had Florian Meyer on the podcast a long time ago now, but he's big into paddle in Germany. Yeah. He, he may be somebody you can hit up for a game someday. A uh, question about, somebody wants to know about your RD7 back in the day. What weight did you play with? Uh, yes, I think the weight was uh, uh, with a string like 352 three or something like this, 350. That's pro level heavy. I think the players are playing with lighter lighter than that. But the amount, we got a lot of questions about your Yonix racket, which was crazy. And... Finally, from all your days playing tennis, what is your most fun memory? Uh, well, the French Open with Courier. This is, uh, too easy. Yeah, yeah, too easy. This one is by, by far my, my, my best memory. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sergi. My pleasure. How are you? Really enjoyed chatting with you. And yeah, hopefully Joe gets back on the court in 21 and things kick off for him. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure, Fabio. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Sergi and picked up some good bits of knowledge. I definitely did. We hope to have more Grand Slam champs on the show very soon. Next week, I speak to Dr. Casey Cordial, who's a sports medicine chiropractor on the Dimitrov team and he's worked with other top tennis players. It's a great episode and can't wait to share it with you. If you want to know more about the Functional Tennis Pointer, head over to functionaltennis.com and as mentioned earlier, we've 10% off when you use the code French Open. Thanks again to our podcast sponsor, Slinger. Hope you enjoy week one, the French Open. And until next week, goodbye.